Now I want to see if you can do a little more of this unpacking of what the negation looks like, what the converse looks like, and what the contrapositive looks like for these other guys over here. Have you already filled in? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. What do we usually associate that with? Right we usually associate that with right angled triangles, okay? Uh, C being your hypotenuse, right? Now, what this is saying is, if you have a right angled triangle, then this relationship between the sides of the right angled triangle must hold, right? Sum of the squares of the two shorter sides is the square of the longer side, the hypotenuse. Okay. Now I want you, and Mrs. Lee's going to come around and have a look at what you've got, I want you to come up with what's the negation, what's the converse, and what's the contrapositive for Pythagoras' theorem. Okay, can you do that? And then lastly over here, oh sorry, I uh, forgot to ask something, is Pythagoras' theorem true, humor me? Yes. yes, it is. But importantly, this guy along the end, I put there just to give you a bit of a, uh, a foil, right? If n is, and again I'm still thinking about whole numbers here, if n's an odd number, is it true that n squared will be even? Oh, no. Now clearly not, right? Because you can think about the squares of the odd numbers. Uh, they are 1, 9, 25, 49, and so on. None of those n squareds are even, right? This is a false statement. Whoopsie daisy. This is false. But whether it's true or false, as you saw when we did the first example, it has implications for the negation, it has implications for the contrapositive, and so on. So. Here's what you're doing now for the next five to seven minutes. I'd like you to fill in what is the negation converse contrapositive. Translate it for these particular examples and then tell me whether they're true or false. Have a go if you've got some questions or you think you're finished, call Mrs. Lee's or I over. Off you go. So guys, I sent some. Most of you are pretty much there. I just want to show you my, here's one I prepared earlier. By the way, fun fact, um, often the way I prepare to teach you guys is I think about, well, how would I explain this to the version of myself a week ago that didn't know that this was, you know, made sense and was true. And so often what I'm doing is I'm creating notes. Now, these are the notes I created before I created that table that you've got there, which is why the, the actual table itself is all janky and handwritten. So anyway, this is the one I had that was ready. Now, just have a look at with, with me. And uh, I just want to sort of tie this up in a neat bow and raise an important point of um, discussion, okay? So, number one, when you have a look at all of the statements, the implications up the top, right? I very purposefully wanted to give you examples that were true, like if n is prime, the square root of n definitely is irrational. Pythagoras' theorem, you've known it for years. But I wanted to give you false statements because you have to interact with false statements a lot when you are proving things. And in particular, sometimes to prove something directly is very awkward and difficult. But proving that the opposite is false is much easier. Let me say that one more time. Sometimes proving an implication true is hard. It's a pain. It looks long and awkward. But if you can take the opposite of it and prove it false, it's great, it just like falls out very nicely, right? Now what that means is you're try the goal is to prove that something is false, which is a bit weird, we're not used to that, right? So that's why I wanted to show you one from the outset. You can see an implication being true means its negation must be false. And then if you compare the top and the bottom, all the way through, if an implication is true, then its contrapositive is also true. And if it's false, the contrapositive is also false. Now, um, the last reason, and the, actually the reason why I picked out these particular examples for your first two columns is, I want you to have a look at my converses, okay? Now, the converse for the first one we saw was false. It's not always true, and Zhao gave us a great counterexample. Six will do it for you, right? Eight will do it for you. In fact, a whole bunch of even numbers will do it for you, okay? But... Sometimes the converse is true. In fact, one of the first things you learned to do with Pythagoras' theorem was if there's some triangle, you know its length, but you don't know if it's right angled, you can prove that it's right angled if the sides form a Pythagorean triad. Okay? So converses can be true, but they aren't always. So great care needs to be taken. Zhao. Yeah, so we thought that particular one was false because A, B, C just by putting them into an equation means that they can be made in others world. Well. Oh sure, okay. So you're picking up on the fact that I've been very bare in my writing here. When I say A, B and C, I refer to them as the shorter to and the longer side of a right angle triangle. So while it may be true that abstractly saying a squared plus b squared equals c squared means there's some magic right angle triangle here, right? 
What I meant was is if you have three sides in a triangle and you find this relationship to be true, then you can know that it'll be right angled. Um, so the converse of Pythagoras' theorem is true is what I'm trying to say. I'll give you one last fun one just for you to have a think about. On your uh, piece of paper or your book, wherever you um, got there, can you draw for me, please, three parallel lines? Just make sure they're not, um, well, I suppose you could draw them equidistant, but it'd be boring. So just draw three parallel lines, like so. Now, once you've drawn three parallel lines, and they really can be anywhere, and it'd be nice if they're different to the person next to you because then we can prove that this is generally true. I would like you to put a pair of lines that cut across your parallel lines, like so. And we call these transversals, trans, they cut across, right? Now, you can go ahead and actually do this. I'm kind of freehanding this, so I can't do it where, where I've got this, but you can actually do some measurements. And what you can actually do is, just look up for a second, um, you can measure what we call the intercepts on these transversals. The intercepts are the, the kind of intervals in between the parallel lines. So for example, this one here, actually I'll color them for you so you can see it. Um, this is an intercept here. And then here, let me pick a different color. Here is another intercept over here. You can measure them. You can get a ruler out and you can go ahead and just say, well, I wonder how long that is, or I wonder how long that is. And I'll give you one more just over here. Now, if you do ditto, and if you drew your parallel lines accurately, you might notice an interesting relationship. For instance, just to make it um, easy for you to work out what it is, I'll give you some numbers for free that I'm just going to make up. If this happened to be one centimeter, and this happened to be two, just by chance, it was double, okay? If you went over and measured the other intercepts, and you see how that one's off on a bit of an angle, right? So it's going to be longer, right? If you found this to be 1.5 centimeters, I can guarantee without measuring that this last one over here will be 3. Now, this is a geometric property which you may have encountered in stage 5, but it's, uh, it's seldom actually used, not much sort of you know, rides on this, so people, once they learn it, even if they did, they rapidly forget about it. Okay? But you can write an if-then statement out of this geometric property. And I would ask you to go and prove it for yourself that you'll see the same kind of ratio business happening. Okay? But when you think about once you've got an if-then statement for it, when you think about the negation, the converse, and the contrapositive, you'll notice something really interesting.